Good afternoon and welcome back to NASA's Johnson Space Center as we continue to take a look at the STS-134 mission and Endeavour's flight to the International Space Station. There's going to be four spacewalks planned for this mission. These will also be the final spacewalks ever conducted by a space shuttle crew. So here to give us more details about all of that is Allison Bollinger. She is the lead spacewalk officer for STS-134. Go ahead. Thanks, Josh. I'm very excited to be here today to talk about the spacewalks that we'll, we will be performing on the STS-134 mission. As Josh mentioned, we have four spacewalks planned on this mission. They will occur on flight days 5, 7, 9, and 11. We will be utilizing three of Endeavour's crew members to perform these spacewalks, and each of these crew members brings a very unique experience base to our team. Our lead spacewalker, EV-1, is Drew Foistel. Drew will be wearing the suit that's marked with a solid red stripe. Drew comes to us with three spacewalks under his belt, which he performed during the STS-125 mission, which was the most recent Hubble telescope servicing mission. So this will be Drew's first trip to the International Space Station, and he will be performing spacewalks one, two, and three. No stranger to spacewalk, however, or I'm sorry, no stranger to the International Space Station is our EV-2 crew member, who will be Mike Fink. Mike has spent just a little over a year on the space station during Expeditions 9 and 18. During that time on the space station, Mike performed six spacewalks. However, all of those spacewalks were in the Russian Orlan suit, so these will be his first spacewalks in the U.S. EMU. He will be wearing the all-white suit on EVAs 2, 3, and 4. Our EV-3 crew member will be Greg Chamatov. Greg will be wearing the suit marked with the broken red stripes. Greg is also no stranger to Space Station. He spent a little over six months up there during the expanding expedition 17 and 18. These will be his first spacewalks, and he will be performing EVAs 1 and 4. The role of the task IV crew member, or the person who remains inside the shuttle to choreograph the spacewalks, will be performed by, as I call it, the odd man in, or one of the three EVA crew members who is not outside performing the spacewalk that day. Endeavour's commander, Mark Kelly, will serve as our suit IV, or the crew member in charge of getting the EVA crew ready to go out the door, which includes depressing and repressing the ISS airlock. He will be assisted by ISS crew members Paolo Nespoli and Ron Guerin to help with his duties. Wrapping up our EVA team is Endeavour's pilot, Greg Box Johnson. I'll refer to him as Greg, I'm sorry, as Box, so as not to confuse him with Greg Chamatov. Greg will be flying, Box will be flying the robotic arm for us on EVAs two and four. Another unique aspect to our mission will be the first time use of a new pre-breathe protocol, which I believe you heard about earlier in Derek's briefing. This new protocol, the protocols are generally used to purge the EVA crew member's body of nitrogen prior to egressing to perform an EVA to avoid getting decompression sickness or the bends. On currently our pre-flight plan on EVAs one, two, and four is to utilize the nominal EVA camp up pre-breathe protocol, which is the protocol in which the crew members are isolated in the ISS airlock at 10.2 PSI overnight. For EVA three, however, we will be we will be utilizing this new aisle or in-suit light exercise pre-breathe protocol. This protocol starts the morning of the EVA and looks very similar to the morning of camp out day of EVA with a slight exception that I'll talk about and show you a video of. The crew members will begin the day by donning oxygen masks. We will depress the airlock down to 10.2 PSI. This will be with the two EV crew members and the three IV crew members who will assist in donning. It's at this time at 10.2 PSI that the crew members will don their suits. Then we will repress the airlock back up to 14.7 PSI. They will perform the nominal 50-minute in-suit resting pre-breathe, which you've seen with the camp out protocol. And then for this new aisle protocol, we will add an additional 50 minutes of light in-suit exercise. So if you could roll the first video. All right, so this is video that was taken during a, one of our training runs at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. On the left side, we've got uh, crew member Mike Fink. On the right side, we have Drew Foistel. And you can see they're performing the light exercise. As, we, as, you, as you could see, it's extremely light exercise, something that I fondly refer to as a slow motion hokey pokey. So during the 50 minutes of this exercise, the crew members will be doing these slight flutter kicks with their legs for four minutes. They will rest for a minute. They will exercise again for four minutes. They will rest for another minute. And we will continue this for the next 50 minutes. 
as Derek mentioned, there are quite a few benefits to this new protocol. Uh, the first one is that the crew members are not isolated in the airlock overnight, so they can have a normal night before EVA and a normal morning of EVA when they first wake up. The crew members spend less time on the oxygen masks, which can be uncomfortable for some crew members. And we are also expecting this protocol to use less of station's precious resource of oxygen. So there's been quite a bit of planning on the ground that has gone into preparing this protocol for flight. So I'm very excited to see it in action on EVA3 and possibly EVA4. With that, I'll go ahead and start detailing uh, the different tasks that we'll be performing on the EVAs. We will start out EVA1 with our highest EVA mission priority, which is to retrieve two experiments that are currently located on the S3 truss. These experiments are called the Materials ISS Experiments, or MISSIs 7A and 7B. These experiments were installed during the STS-129 mission on the Express Logistics Carrier, or ELC-2. We will retrieve these experiments and then take them to the payload bay for the return home. While we're in the payload bay, we'll retrieve a new MISSI-8 experiment, which Drew will install in the spot where MISSI-7A was located. The middle part of this EVA will be dedicated to setting up for EVA-2's ammonia refill of the cooling system out on the P6 truss. This is the cooling system that cools the batteries for the solar arrays out there. It's also referred to as the PVTCS, or photovoltaic, photovoltaic thermal control system. This system has been experienced a slight leak over the past few years and needs to be refilled with ammonia in order for it to keep properly functioning. This task isn't as straightforward as it seems since the P6 truss is isolated from the primary ammonia tank located on the P1 side of the truss. We will need to hook up a series of jumpers that span from the P1 ammonia tank assembly all the way outboard to the P6 truss. On EVA1, we will work on setting up those jumpers and venting the nitrogen pad that was launched inside these jumpers in preparation for EVA2. We'll finish up the EVA by translating down to the lab and installing two new antennas and their associated octopus of cables. These antennas will eventually talk wirelessly to experiments that are located on the express logistics carrier. So with that, we can roll EVA1 video. EVA1, we'll start out at the airlock with Drew Foistel and Greg Chamatov. Both crew members will translate out to the starboard side of the truss to the ELC-2, where they will start their work on the MISSI 7A and 7B experiments. They will demate existing electrical and data cables. They will close the, the doors on the experiment. They will release it and then stow it on their body restraint tether. Here's some footage from the neutral buoyancy lab of Drew and Greg practicing this. Once they have the experiments both stowed on their body restraint tethers, they will translate down to Endeavor's payload bay. Greg will work on the starboard side of the payload bay. Drew will work on the port side. They will work on transferring the MISSI experiments from their body restraint tethers to the sidewall carriers for the return trip home. Drew will translate aft in the payload bay then to retrieve the MISSI 8 experiment. Both crew members will then translate back up to the S3 truss. Drew will translate to the top of the ELC-2 once again, where he will install the new MISSI-8. He will open the cover on it, and then install two connectors providing data and power. He will also take photos once he's done this. Meanwhile, Greg will work on installing a light on the S3 truss. This is called a CETA light, or Crew Equipment and Translation Aid light. Here's a photo of the light in the install location. The light has a single bolt, and there's a single electrical connector that provides power to this light. Once he's completed that worksite, he'll translate a little further outboard to the P3 Sarge, or Sola Alpha Rotary Joint, where he will work on reinstalling a cover that protects that Sarge. This cover was first removed during an increment 16 EVA. This cover has six bolts. Once complete on the starboard side of the truss, both crew members will translate over to the port side of the truss to start setting up for that fill on EVA2. They will demate a 16-foot-long jumper that we have that's currently stowed on the P4 bulkhead. They will need to lock the port Sarge in order to do this. Greg will work on installing the port side of the, uh, the P4 side of this jumper, and Drew will work on installing the P3 side of this jumper. Once they have that jumper installed, Drew will translate outboard to the P5, P6 junction, where he will demate a fluid line. He will mate it up to a nitrogen vent tool. At this point in time, we have a continuous pipeline running from P5 all the way into the P1 ammonia tank assembly. He will vent the nitrogen pad from this line.
and then he will translate outboard to the final jumper that runs to the P6 PVTCS. He will demate, demate that jumper, mate the nitrogen vent tool, and then once again vent the nitrogen pad from this jumper. Once we're complete with venting the nitrogen from the P3, P4 jumper, we will need to demate one side of it in order to allow the port surge to rotate between EVAs for power generation. So Greg will work on demating the P3 side of that jumper. He will route it back over to its stowage panel on P4 where he will mate it. And then he will secure the line with a wire tie on a handrail to ensure that it doesn't get caught up in the surge rotational envelope. Both crew members will then translate over to the US lab node 2 interface on the Nader side there where they will set up for installing those new antennas. Drew will first set up a medium bag that contains the two antennas as well as that octopus of cables. And Greg will start his work on the top side of the lab where he will be removing two existing handrails and installing two new handrails that already have the antennas integrated on them. These handrails each have two bolts. Here, here's a flight photo. Here's a flight photo of the antenna integrated on the handrail. And here's some footage from the neutral buoyancy lab of Greg performing this work. Once he's complete, he will translate Nader on the lab to help Drew with their next task of installing this octopus of cable. They will release a gap spanner open up a shield which will, which will reveal an existing EWIS or external wireless instrumentation system cable which they will demate and then they will work on installing this new set of cables. They have two connections that they need to make underneath this shield. Then they will work on routing the six legs of this cable. Once they've made those connections under the shield, they'll work together to close it up and install the two Zeus fastener, three Zeus fasteners that hold it down. They will then finish demating that old EWIS cable. It will be temp stood in a bag to return inside. They will route two lines of this cable up to the antennas that Greg just installed. They will route another two lines and they'll just temp stow those for future use. And then they will finally install the final two legs of this cable into those EWIS antennas so that that system still remains functional. Once they're complete at the work site, Greg will reinstall the gap spanner and work on ensuring all the tools have been stowed inside the medium bag to return back to the airlock. And Drew will head off early to translate back to the airlock to start more preparation work for the EVA2 ammonia fill. He will retrieve a few tools from the larger uh, fluid quick disconnect bag, which he will relocate to the vent tool extender bag. He will also work on retrieving from the airlock a bag that contains two of the power jumper cables that we will be installing on EVA3. Our airlock is so full on EVA3 that we need to preemptively stow these cables external to the airlock in preparation for EVA3. Once complete with that task, both crew members will translate back to the airlock. They will ingress, and that completes EVA1. EVA2 has two main objectives. The first of those objectives is to finish up the the ammonia fill of the P6 cooling system that we set up for on EVA1. Once this fill is complete, we need to vent residual ammonia from those lines, and we will do this in two separate vents. The next major task on this EVA is to perform a relubrication of the port sarge, or solar alpha rotary joint. This preventative maintenance was first performed on the STS-126 mission. In order to do this, we will remove six protective covers over the Sarge. We will use two different styles of grease guns to apply a first coat of lubrication to the Sarge. We will then wait for the ground to rotate the Sarge 200 degrees. We will come back out, apply the second coat of lubrication, and then reinstall those protective covers. While this 200 degree rotation of the Sarge is ongoing, we have a few tasks for the crew members to perform. Drew will be utilizing his grease gun once again to apply a thin coat of grease to Dexter's latching end effector. He will apply grease to those snares to help it, it function properly. And Mike will work on installing some stowage beams that will eventually hold radiator grapple bars. So with that, we can go ahead and roll the EVA2 video. EVA2 will start out at the airlock once again with crew members Drew Foistel and Mike Fink. Drew. Drew will translate to the top side of the airlock where he will retrieve the vent tool extender bag. He will stow that in his body restraint tether. Mike will retrieve a medium bag that contains the tools for his port sarge lubrication. 
He will translate out to the port sarge and set up shop out there with his bag. They will then work together to reinstall that P3, P4 jumper that was temporarily stowed at the end of EVA1. Drew will reconnect the P3 side. Then he will translate outboard to the midpoint of P6 where he will temporarily stow the vent tool extension bag. Meanwhile, Mike will make his way back to the, P, the P1 A500 panel, which we call home plate. This panel is, is hooked up to the ammonia tank assembly, which is a large box above Mike. It's currently set up for a vent configuration in a contingency case when they needed to vent the ammonia tank. He will relocate it to a fill location, which will now allow ammonia to flow from this ammonia tank outboard. So at this time, the ground will perform an initial leak check of the pipeline to verify everything's solid and it looks good. Once the leak check is complete, verifying we have a good line from the ammonia tank assembly out to P5, Drew will mate a P5, P6 jumper, allowing the ammonia to flow even further outboard. Then he will translate out to the final jumper, where he will throw two valves, which will allow ammonia to finally flow to its final destination of the P6 PVTCS. This ammonia fill should take approximately 10 minutes. During that time, he will be setting up the vent tool extension in preparation for the two vents that we need to do. He will aim the nozzle of the vent tool extension in a retrograde direction. Once we're complete with the fill, Drew will demate one side of this jumper and will install a cap to ensure the ammonia stays nicely inside that PVTCS. Then he will work on routing the vent tool extension line inboard to set up for the first vent. To start the vent, he will demate the P5 jumper from its P6 male and mate it up to the vent tool extension. Once he starts this vent, it takes about 17 minutes to vent the ammonia that's running from this jumper all the way back to the P1 ammonia tank. While all of the outboard operations have been going on with the fill and vent, Mike has been working diligently at the port sarge to start that lubrication. His first task is to remove the six protective covers over the sarge. Once he has those covers removed, he will be using an EVA camera to take some pictures, and then he will also be using an EVA wipe to take some samples of the grease that was left over from STS-126 so folks on the ground can analyze that. He will then make use of two grease guns to perform this lubrication. The top left picture shows the J-hook nozzle grease gun, and the top right shows the straight nozzle grease gun. Once the 17-minute vent is complete, Drew will remate the P5 jumper to its dummy male on P5, and he will work on rerouting the vent tool extension outboard to that smaller jumper. This smaller jumper vent should only take approximately four minutes. However, it has the unique constraint that we need to initiate this vent during an eclipse pass. So if the day-night cycles do not work out in our favor, Drew will simply head inboard and assist Mike in the port sarge lubrication. He has his own set of grease guns to help out with this. Once we're done with the four-minute vent, Drew will relocate this jumper to a new stowage location. And then he will work on coiling and stowing the ventral extension back in its bag. And then he will stow the vent tool extension bag on his body restraint tether and he will translate back inboard. Now that we're complete with the ammonia fill, we need to stow the P3, P4 jumper. So the two crew members will work together to install it back on its P4 stowage bulkhead. And then once we verify that all tools, tethers, and crew members are inboard of the Sarge, we'll give the ground a go to start its 200 degree rotation. This rotation will not be nearly as fast as shown here. It will take approximately 45 minutes to do this 200 degree rotation. While that's ongoing, Drew will translate back to the home plate panel to reconfigure that jumper to the vent location for the ammonia tank assembly in a contingency case. And then he will translate up to the port crew equipment aid and translation or CETA cart where he will retrieve a foot restraint. He will stow that in his body restraint tether and then translate to the nader side of the P1 truss. At this time, he'll start working with Box, who's inside the station, flying the station's robotic arm, which is grappled to Dexter. Drew and Box will work together to maneuver Dexter so that Drew can install his foot restraint, and then he will work on installing a lens cover over the camera that's on, that's on Dexter's uh, latching end effector. He will then work on retrieving the straight nozzle grease gun that he brought with him 
and he will start performing the lubrication on SPDM's latching end effector snares. Here's a view of what Drew will be looking at. You can see the snares located inside the latching end effector and also the camera that he just installed the lens cover on. Here's some footage from the neutral buoyancy lab of Drew practicing this work. Once they're complete with the full lubrication, Drew will work with Box to maneuver Dexter once again so that he can utilize it to egress his foot restraint. Drew will then retrieve that foot restraint and stow it back on the port seat cart where he found it. Meanwhile, Mike had translated back to the airlock and he had stowed the vent tool extension bag back on top of the airlock where it was originally located prior to the EVA. He also retrieved a medium bag that contained the two grapple bar stowage beams. Then translates to the Zenith side of S1 where he works on installing first the inboard grapple bar stowage beam. This beam has two bolts. And then he'll work on installing the outboard stowage beam which also has two bolts. Once both crew members are complete with their work inboard of the Sarge and the ground is verified that the Sarge rotation is complete, both crew members will translate outboard to finish up the port Sarge lubrication. They will use their own sets of guns to apply one more final coat of lubrication to the Sarge race ring. Then they will work together to reinstall the six covers that protect the Sarge. Four of these six covers have four bolts apiece and two of these covers have six bolts apiece. Once they're complete with the cover install, they're verified that they have all of their tools and tethers packed inside that medium bag. They will retrieve that, verify the work site is clear, then they will translate back to the airlock and ingress. And that completes EVA 2. EVA 3 will be spent mostly on the Russian segment, so we're very lucky to have Mike Fink with all of his vast Russian experience performing this EVA. The first task will be to install a power and data grapple fixture on the Russian FGB. The power and data grapple fixture along with its power and data cables and a video signal conditioner that we will install next to it will allow the SSRMS or station's robotic arm to eventually walk off and use this as a base for future use. Once we're complete with that task, we will work on installing the two power cables that we temp stowed outside the airlock at the end of EVA1, we refer to these as Y jumper cables. We have a port side cable and a starboard side cable. These cables run from node one, port, node one forward to node one nadir, and then and node one aft nadir, and then back to the FGB. And this will provide a redundancy to the Russian segment and its power. So with that, we can go ahead and roll EVA3 video. EVA 3 will start out at the joint airlock once again with crew members Drew Foistel and Mike Fink. Drew will first work on relocating that power cable bag that he temp stowed at the end of EVA 1 back to the Russian FGB. Mike will work on retrieving a medium sized bag with a crew lock bag inside of it and he will set up shop on the port side of the truss. I'm sorry, on the port side of the FGB. Mike will then install a gap spanner that will help with the translation later in the EVA. And the two crew members will work together to remove five pieces of multi-layer insulation or MLI that's currently protecting the install locations for the PDGF and the VSC. Once this MLI is removed, they will bundle it together with a wire tie and then use a few additional wire ties to secure it to a handrail in the Russian segment. This MLI will probably be jettisoned on a future Russian EVA. Both crew members will then translate back to the airlock to assist one another with retrieving the PDGF and its frame. As you can see, it's a fairly large piece of equipment, so they will both be tethered to it and kind of inchworm it back to its install location on the port side of the FGB. Once they get it soft docked, they will tighten the three feet that hold the PDGF in place. Then they will work on installing the video signal conditioner. This VSC has a single bolt and then they will route three cables that are installed on the PDGF to this video signal conditioner. Then they will retrieve and route a fourth cable which was temporarily stowed by a previous shuttle crew. Once that's installed, once all the cables are installed, they will install a hard protective cover on top of the VSC. So at this point in time that we will start work on installing the Y jumpers. 
Mike will first retrieve the port jumper, and then he will make his way up to the forward zenith side of node one into an area we call the rat's nest because there are so, so many cables inside there. He will demate an existing cable from the rat's nest and temp stow this Y jumper. Then he will translate to node one aft nadir where he will demate another existing connector and temp stow the Y jumper. At this point in time, Drew will start his work on the PMA1 FGB interface where they, he will demate a connector from the FGB, mate it to this new Y jumper, and then he will also demate a second connector which will route down to the PDGF. Once Drew is complete with his work, he will give Mike a go to start making his connections. Mike will mate the rat's nest cable to one end of the Y jumper. He will then secure the cable with wire ties to make sure it doesn't interfere with translation paths. And then he will translate back down to node one nadir aft again where he will mate up the second leg of the Y jumper. At this point in time, we've completed work on the port side of the Y jumper install. The ground will start verifying the connections we made and will also start putting inhibits in place for the starboard side of these Y jumpers. This task should take about 45 minutes, so during that time, we will finish up the PDGF install by routing the final 1553 data cable. This cable routes from connectors coming off of the PDGF and they go over to node three. Once complete with that work and once we verify that the ground has the inhibits in place for the starboard Y jumper install, Mike will make his way with the starboard cable back up to the rat's nest area once again, this time on the starboard side. He will demate an existing rat's nest cable and temp stow his Y jumper. Then he will translate to node one aft nader, where he will demate an existing cable and temp stow his Y jumper. And then Drew will start his work once again on the PMA1 FGB interface where he will demate an FGB cable that he hooks up to his Y jumper. And then he'll demate a second cable from the FGB which will route down to the PDGF. Just like on the starboard side, once Drew is done with his work, he'll give Mike the go. Mike will start making his connections. He'll fir first hook up the rat's nest cable to the Y jumper, wire tie the cable down, and then make his way to the node one nadir aft where he'll finish up the Y jumper install task. Once complete, both crew members will translate back over to the PDGF install site. Mike will work on cleaning up the work site and Drew will take photos of the FGB thrusters which are located right there as well as the newly installed PDGF. Both crew members will then translate back to the airlock and that will complete EVA3. EVA-4 is mainly dedicated to stowing Endeavour's orbital boom sensor system, or boom as I'll refer to it, on the space station for a future contingency use. In order to stow this, we'll make use of stands that the STS-123 mission first used when they stowed the boom in, pre in preparation for STS-124. In order to get the most use out of this boom as a contingency tool on station, we will need to change out the grapple fixture which is located at the end of the boom. The boom currently has an EFGF, or electrical flight releasable grapple fixture, and this grapple fixture is not compatible with the station's robotic arm. So we will work on removing that grapple fixture and then retrieving a power and data grapple fixture, a PDGF, from P6 which is no longer being used, and we will install that on the orbiter boom sensor system in order to make it more useful for uh, future station contingencies. We'll finish out the EVA on the P3 truss and the newly installed Express Logistics Carrier 3 doing some work on Dexter's spare arm which launched on this carrier. When the STS-123 mission first assembled Dexter, they had some difficulty releasing the fasteners that held Dexter's arm and the launch equipment. And so in order to make lives easier for future station crews in the unlikely event that they'll need Dexter's spare arm, we're going to preemptively release those fasteners using a specially designed tool to help lighten the load on our crew members. With that, we can go ahead and roll the EVA-4 video. EVA-4 will start out at the joint airlock once again with crew members Mike Fink and Greg Chamatoff. Mike will have a medium bag that contains the adapter assembly that we will need to install the PDGF on the boom. He will temporarily stow that on the S1 truss. And Greg will work on reconfiguring and retrieving a foot restraint, which is currently on the airlock toolbox. He'll stow that on his body restraint tether and then translate up to the S1 truss. Once he's up there, he will install that foot restraint in the S1 truss. Then he will ingress it 
ingress the foot restraint, and then both crew members will work on their own respective stands, and they'll work with Box, who's inside the station, flying the station's robotic arm, which is grappled to the midpoint of the boom. They'll work together to back the boom into place to where the EVA crew members can take control of it. Box will back off the arm, and the two EVA crew members will work together to slowly back the boom into the stands. They will then lock it in place. Mike will start work on the sensor end of the boom. Since without the EFGF, there's no way to apply power to these sensors, they're eventually going to die. So we will demate the electrical connectors from these sensors and install two new grounding connectors, which will ground the boom to the space station. While that work's ongoing, Greg is reconfiguring a foot restraint and working with Box to maneuver the arm back so Greg can install that foot restraint on the arm. Greg will be using the arm as a work platform later in the EVA for the grapple fixture swap. Both crew members will then translate all the way outboard to the P6 truss. Greg will work on setting up the foot restraint for Mike to ingress. Mike will hop in the foot restraint, install a handling aid on the PDGF, and then together they will release the four fasteners that are holding the PDGF on the P6 truss. Once released, they will stow the grapple fixture on Mike's body restraint tether, and Greg will retrieve the foot restraint. Both crew members will then start making their way back towards the S1 truss in the boom. Greg will make a quick pit stop where he will drop off that foot restraint on the port seat of cart. And then Greg will work with Box to slowly maneuver the arm into position to where Greg can ingress the foot restraint. Greg will then maneuver over to Mike where he will retrieve the PDGF and stow that on his body restraint tether. And then both crew members will translate up to the grapple fixture swap location. They will work on releasing the EFGF, which has six bolts. Once they release that, they will need to peel back the EFGF and cut the electrical cable that runs down to those sensors. Mike will stow that in the medium bag. Then they will work on installing the PDGF adapter assembly, or PAA. This has six bolts, and then it provides a mounting ring for the PDGF to be installed. They'll then work together to install the PDGF and tighten down the four fasteners that hold it in place. And we now have a new grapple fixture on the end of the boom. Greg will then work with Box to maneuver back to his egress position, where he will egress the APFR and then catch a free ride over to the starboard seat of cart. Greg will transfer the foot restraint from the arm to that starboard seat of cart. Greg then translates to the Zenith aft side of S0, where he inspects and cinches a long-duration tie-down tether, which is currently holding down Dexter's old OTP, or ORU temp stow platform. Meanwhile, Mike has retrieved that medium bag that contained the EFGF, which was removed from the boom, and he translates down to Endeavor's payload bay. Once he's down there, he opens up the door on Endeavor's port toolbox, or tool stowage assembly, and he will transfer the, grap the EFGF grapple fixture from his medium bag to this port TSA so it can return home with Endeavor. Once he's complete stowing that grapple fixture in the TSA, he will close the door and tighten the four latches. And then both crew members will start making their way out to the port truss. Once out on P3, they will translate along the newly installed Express Logistics Carrier ELC3, and this is where they will work on releasing the three fasteners that held Dexter's spare arm in place for launch. Once the first fastener is, is released, they will work together to use a 40-inch long pry rod. This was the tool that was specially designed for this task. One crew member will insert this pry load and offload the adjacent fasteners as the other crew member releases those fasteners. Once these fasteners are released, there are two clamps that are still holding the spare arm on its stowage location. Once complete with that task, Greg will translate to the opposite side of ELC-3, where he will install a protective cover on the grapple fixture on the high-pressure gas tank. He will also take some photos of a DOD payload, which is in that gold mylar. Both crew members will clean up their work site and translate back to the joint airlock. They will ingress, and we will be closing the hatch for the final time on an EVA conducted by space shuttle crew members.
So with that, that completes my briefing. I'll hand it back over to you. Okay. Let's take some questions here at the Johnson Space Center first, and we'll see if we have any of the other centers. Who would like to go first? Go ahead. Mark Kramer from CBS. The uh, PDGF that comes off P6, was that a spare, or was that used actively and taking it away? Does that mean you lose some capability? It was used, so that PDGF doesn't have any per power or anything provided to it, so it was never used as a base for the SSRMS. It was used when they first installed P6 on top of Z1 during the 4A mission. So it's just, it's just out there now, not serving any purpose. Anyone else? Get out of here. Marsha. <clears throat> Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, because you had that one extra day, maybe, um, if you didn't get everything done during four, would you consider a 50 VA, or are you pretty hard down with four this time? I think, I think we'll be pretty good with, with four EVAs. I don't think it was that plus one day, since we only have three total crew members, we can't do back-to-back -back EVAs, so we would need to add two additional days mm -hmm. in order to support a fifth EVA. But I think we should have enough time, and this crew is so well trained that I don't think we should, we should easily be able to fit all of our nominal tasks within our four EVAs. Is that it? Okay, Claire. Hi, Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. Um, can you just talk about, in general, how these EVAs rate in terms of difficulty and complexity to general EVAs, and also just how much time the crews have had to put in to rehearse these? Okay, great question. So let's see, I'll, I'll, for, I'll answer your second question first. So in, or, in terms of the number of runs that we've done in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab for each of the EVAs, it's helped that we've slipped about nine months since our original launch date in July. So for EVAs one and two, we've done 10 runs. EVA 3, since that was added later in the flow, we've done four runs of that, and then we've done nine runs of EVA 4. So that's 10, 10, 4, and 9. So in terms of difficulty, I would say, I think EVAs 1, 3, and 4 are probably standard difficulty level EVAs. EVA 2 is the one that involves quite a bit of choreography between the ground for both the, the refill of the, of the P6 cooling system the crew members have to wait for goes from the ground and then have to give the ground goes. And so there's quite a bit of choreography between, between that fill task and also just the sheer number of fluid quick disconnects that we're touching during this EVA. Those fluid QDs have historically caused quite a few problems during EVAs. So we have, I think it's a total of 11 fluid, fluid QDs that we're touching throughout this EVA multiple times. We're opening and closing them both a, a few times on EVA 1, but most of the time on EVA 2. So that's probably one of the most difficult and challenging tasks on this flight. Okay. Over here. Edge Keen with Harvard Journalism. Can you explain again what is it about what you call the slow hokey pokey, that exercise that makes the aisle possible? Well, I'm definitely not a medical doctor, and I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I can't even pretend to be one. But it's my understanding that it's, it's all about the oxygen exchange. So just the fact that you're in the suit and you're exerting, you know, you're do, exerting yourself a little bit and you're kind of getting your heart rate up so your blood's pumping a little bit faster. And it's, so it's all about exertion level, and so you're exchanging oxygen at a higher rate. And then the actual movement itself helps move any little nitrogen bubbles that might be in the veins. So it's all about... You're yeah, just kind of working yourself out a little bit. And like you saw, it's very, very light exercise that we're talking about here because we don't want the crew members to wear themselves out before they go out the door. But just anything over just sitting there helps metabolically and, and medically. Okay. Marcia. Um, Marcia and Associated Press again. This will be the last shuttle crew going out on a spacewalk ever. Um, have you given that much thought or... What, what are your thoughts about, you know, 30 years of, you know, shuttle program ending and the last, the very last shuttle-based spacewalk? Right. Well, you know, I grew up, I, I hate to admit it, but I was born after STS-1. So I have only ever known a world that's had shuttle flights in it. So it's, it's going to be a very, a very bittersweet but very proud moment for me to be able to help execute uh, these EVAs. And, you know, I think... Life aboard the space station is still going to be exciting in terms of EVAs. We're still going to be doing spacewalks. So my job personally won't, won't change that much, but we'll, we'll continue to do spacewalks. Um, but I think it'll just be a very exciting time to actually complete, to help complete the, the space shuttle program. All right, is that it in here? I think we just lost half the room with 
<laughs> I had to throw it in there. Right, sorry. We're going we're gonna to wrap up today's briefing. Coming up at two o'clock is going to be the crew news conference with the entire STS-134 crew. So we will take a quick break here on NASA TV. We will see you back here at the top of the hour. We thank you for joining us.